Okay, we are marking up. Oh, now I'm Good morning. This is a continuation of the morning meeting of the House Appropriations on March 10th. And we are turning to H711, which is a an act entitled The Creation of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee and the Opioid Abatement Special Fund. And we welcome um, members of the of the House Human Services Committee, Chair Pugh and Representative Garifano. Not Garifano. Thank you for joining us. It's the first time that you've been in our committee, and, and um, we're delighted to see you. And excuse me for mispronouncing your name. Um, what we like to do with the bills is we like to generally understand what what the purpose of the bill is and why it's being created but then we try to focus down on those areas that are within our jurisdiction um, people have not seen the bill since it just came out of your committee it was just passed out so we'll be kind of reading along with you and so forgive us if we don't understand kind of the particulars but that's how we like to do it i think we've set aside now about 25 minutes um so if you can do an overview and then help and then we'll have some questions i'm sure so thank you and um we also welcome lunch council for being here thank you for taking time okay over to you Thank you, Madam Chair um, and uh, Appropriations Committee. This is my first time <laughs> in your committee and my first time reporting a bill. So I will do my best. Um, 8711, um, as you know, will create the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee and the Opioid Abatement Special Fund, which was included in the Comprehensive National Settlement that was reached this past summer in uh, the suits against McKesson and Cardinal and Amerisource Burke. Approximately 64 million is allocated for the state of Vermont in that settlement. The settlements are designed to be allocated in three buckets, 15% to the state subdivisions to be used to abate the opioid crisis, 15% to state to remediate for past expenses for opioid crisis, for future abatement and 70% to a statewide abatement fund, which is the, the, uh, what this bill covers. The National Settlement Agreement prescribes the creation of the Advisory Committee and the Opioid Abatement Special Fund. The Advisory Committee will manage the Opioid Abatement Special Fund, which includes the 70% of the monies received from the National, national Settlement. The National Settlement also prescribed the Advisory Committee have equal number of state and municipal members and make recommendations regarding remediation spending from the Opioid Abatement Special Fund. The Settlement also prescribes that the state designate an agency as a lead agency as a single point of contact submitting requests for funding to the National Settlement Fund Administrator. 8711 will designate the Vermont Department of Health as a lead agency. I'll stop there if there's any questions before I go through the rest of the poll. Okay, thanks. Um, just I'm looking around the room and I'm not seeing any, uh, but we waited long enough. Yeah, it's Grab just it. I didn't quite hear um, the percentage from the suit settlement going into the Fund? The abatement fund, 70%. 70? 70. 70. Thank you. I, I should have mentioned the acoustics in this room are pretty rough, and if you can, yell at us. <laughs> we really do invite people to. I can hear you fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I might, <clears throat> the 70% the of the 64 million is over 18 years. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So is, is the amount received over 18 years or we have to spend it over 18 years or both? Yeah. 
the settlement is for 18 years. Okay. The total that we have is 64. Gotcha. But does it 64 come into the funds this year? Doesn't work does in anywhere. We have to ask we for it. We have to ask for it. Okay, we're going to learn about this. So it is the, um, the job of the advisory committee and the lead agency to uh, meet, review, uh, and come up with recommendations and then the lead agency will submit a request for money to fund those recommendations. I will now go over the uh, membership of the advisory committee. Um, the advisory committee will be composed of the commissioner of health or designee. And that uh, person will, uh, will serve as uh, chair, as a non-voting chair. Commissioner of mental health or designee, chief prevention officer of the state of Vermont. One current member of the House of Representatives appointed by the Speaker of the House. One current member of the Senate appointed by, appointed by committee on committees. A primary care prescriber with experience providing medication assisted treatment within the blueprint for health hub and spoke model, appointed by the executive director of the blueprint for health, to provide a statewide perspective on the provision of medication assisted treatment services. An individual with experience providing substance misuse prevention services and education programming appointed by the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. An individual with experience providing substance misuse treatment or recovery services appointed by the Clinical Director of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Program or its successor. A provider with academic research credentials appointed by UVM. Two individuals with lived experience of opioid use disorder, including at least one who is in recovery, one member appointed by Howard, Center Safe, Howard Center's Safe Recovery Program, and one member appointed by the Vermont Association of Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. An assistant judge appointed by the Vermont Association of County Judges. And 10 individuals, each employed by employed by or an agent of a different city or town that collect collectively reflects Vermont's diverse population and geography. And those individuals will be appointed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I'll pause again for any questions. <laughs> we, we, should have, we should have a sign on our door that says, Big committees, task forces. <laughs> so we're going to have a lot of questions around why that. Um, I, I, is that where? Yes. You, yeah. So maybe let, let's go through the bill and understand and see what what the bill proposes. But I think we'll come back to that. And just as a warning, we're we're going. Oh my goodness, that is huge. So. But why don't we keep going? Okay. I will continue. Thank you, Madam um, Chair. I'm going to skip over the term of, uh, of the advisory committee and, um, and the removal process and move on to powers and duties. The advisory committee shall demonstrate broad ongoing consultation with individuals living with opioid use disorder about their direct experience with related systems, including medication assisted treatment, residential treatment, recovery services, harm reduction services, overdose, supervision by the Department of Corrections and involvement with the Department for Children and Families, Family Services Division. The advisory committee shall demonstrate consultation with individuals with direct lived experience of opioid use disorder, frontline support professionals, the Substance Misuse Advisory Council, and other stakeholders to identify spending priorities as related to opioid use disorder prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery services, and harm reduction strategies for the purpose of providing recommendations to the governor, the Department of Health, and the General Assembly on prioritizing spending from the Opioid Abatement Special Fund. The 
committee shall also consider the impact of opioid crisis on communities throughout Vermont, including communities abatement needs and proposals for abatement strategies and responses. The perspective of and proposals from opioid use disorder prevention coalition recovery centers and medication assistant treatment providers and the ongoing challenges of the opioid crisis on marginalized populations, including individuals who have lived experience of opioid use disorder. Annually, the advisory committee shall present its recommendations for expenditures from the opioid abatement special fund established pursuant to this subchapter to the Department of Health and concurrently submit its recommendations in writing to the House Committees on Appropriations and on Human Services and the Senate Committees on Appropriations and on Health and Welfare. The committee shall uh, have their first meeting before June 30th of 2022. They shall meet at least quarterly, but not more than six times per calendar year, and shall adopt procedures to govern its proceedings, including voting procedures and how the staggered terms shall be apportioned among members. The meetings shall be consistent with Vermont's open meeting law. And uh, the members of the General Assembly who are serving on the committee are entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement pursuant to uh, BSA 23. Other members of the advisory committee shall also be entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses as permitted under 32 BSA 1010. I've already mentioned that the Department of Health shall serve as the uh, lead agency and the single point of contact for submitting requests for funding to the National Settlement Fund Administrator. Approved requests shall be dispersed to the department for deposit into the opioid abatement, abatement special fund established in section 4774 of this subchapter. The abatement special fund will be established and managed pursuant to 32 VSA chapter seven, subchapter five and administered by the Department of Health. The special fund shall consist of all abatement account fund monies dispersed by the National Settlement Fund Administrator to the department. The department shall include a spending plan informed by the recommendations of the advisory committee established and as part of its annual budget submission and excuse me and as part of their annual budget submission and once approved the department shall request to have the funds formally released from the national abatement account funds and shall disperse the monies from the opioid abatement special fund pursuant to 32 PSA chapter seven, subchapter three. The special fund shall supplement and not supplant or replace any existing or future local, state, or federal government funding for infrastructure programs, support, and resources, including health insurance benefits, federal grant funding, and Medicaid and Medicare funds. The special fund shall be used for the following opioid prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and evaluation activities. I will pause again before I go through the list of the permissible uh, <coughs> expenses for any questions. Not seeing any, and did have, you did say yes. you want to go back. Yeah. Yes, so regarding the um, the uh, per diem that is paid to the two legislative members as well as the oh roughly um, 14 other members who are not otherwise paid uh, is that an allowable use under this fund from the opioid settlement fund 
Because it's all opioid settlement fund money and not general fund money. I will defer to legislative. I don't understand. I believe so, but let me take a look at the draft to see where it might be covered and get back to you. Okay, thank you. And, and you know, I don't think you need to. We can read yes. the list in the bill of of the appropriate uses of this. So. Uh, we just skip through that. Yeah, I think you can, or maybe give us a couple of examples and then move on to the next, if you'd like. Uh, the answer to the question about the permissible of the per diem is, um, so the, on page nine, um, there's a list of permissible expenses and subdivision 13 on line 14 is the cost of administrative, technical, and legal assistance provided to the advisory council, so that would cover it. Is there a percentage that can be used, or is it just it's not specified. our cost? Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, as uh, it relates to the expenditures from the opioid uh, special um, abatement special fund, uh, this list came from the national supplement yeah. that was reached with the attorney general, and. Um, all the activities are related to prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and evaluation activities. So it's really to um, evade the opioid crisis. And uh, the list, again, came from the national settlement. Any additional questions about the permissible expenditures? I think we can keep going. Great. The um, national settlement also had um, uh, prioritized uh, expenditures from the opioid uh, abatement special fund, which is that list begins on page nine. Line 18, I believe. So the priority expenditures are the appropriate use of on naloxone, uh, expanding training for rec first responders, schools, community, and support groups and families, uh, increasing distribution to individuals who are uninsured, and increasing access to medication assisted treatment. Um, I'm sorry. And, and while you're, um, and we have another question here, Rep. Fagan. So, um, thank you, Rep. Rep. Garifano. 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 Okay, sorry. Um, so, on page ten. Uh, sub 2A and sub 2B, it would appear to me that, that, and this is great, is that we need to maintain a maintenance of current effort and then apply these funds above our maintenance of effort. Oh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I, yeah. Somewhere in here, I think I saw it, that these funds may not supplant Correct. existing efforts that they are on top of. Correct. Or in the future. So, doing. yeah, so yeah. hence my comment about yeah. maintenance of effort. Yeah. Thank you. Additional prioritization is providing education to school based and youth focused programs that discourage or prevent misuse of opioids. Providing medication assisted education and awareness training to healthcare providers, emergency medical technicians, law enforcement, and other first responders. Providing treatment and recovery support services, such as residential and inpatient treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, outpatient therapy, or counseling. Assisting pregnant and postpartum individuals. Specifically enhancing services for screening, brief intervention, and referral to expert. 
expanding comprehensive evidence base or evidence informed treatment and recovery services, providing comprehensive wraparound services to pregnant and postpartum individuals with opioid use disorder, <coughs> expanding treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome, expanding the availability of warm handoff programs and recovery services, and treating incarcerated populations, supporting prevention programs, specifically funding for media campaigns to prevent <coughs> funding for evidence-based or evidence-informed prevention in schools, funding for healthcare providers, provider education and outreach regarding best prescribing practices for opioid consistent with current Department of Health and US um, CDC prevention guidelines, and expanding syringe service programs, facilitating evidence-based or evidence-informed data collection and research and analyzing and evaluating the effectiveness of the payment strategies within Vermont. The bill would be effective upon passage. That's all I have. Thank you. So we, we are going to have a, a number of questions, um, and I think they're going to be around the fund. I think it's Robin that are answering. Rep Shy, thank you. And thanks for presenting this. This is great. I was also doing some math while you were talking about it. It, it strikes me that uh, the settlement sounds like it was fairly prescriptive in what you could do and what you couldn't do, which in a way is helpful in terms of creating the bill because you're not deciding what you need to do. They're telling you. So I'm assuming that pretty much everything in here is fairly prescriptive. So that kind of leads me back to the advisory group. And there's 22 people, I think, of which 21 are voting members because the chair is not. Um, and you had said that we needed an equal representation of, um, I forgot exactly, but the state representatives state and, and, and municipal. ordinary and municipal and just citizens, I suppose. I mean, how prescriptive was the, other than that, sort of headline, how prescriptive was the um, the rest of the requirements for the advisory group? And so how did you end up with 22 people? We heard from um, in testimony um, and on who would be best uh, able to represent this community and make recommendations to um, General Assembly and um, the lead agency on how the funds should be expended. So a lot of the um, membership from for the advisory committee came from uh, testimony. I add uh, the bones of this bill was presented to us by the assistant AG and by the um, governor's prevention officer. Um, I don't know, and Ledge Council may be able to tell us um, what besides the need to be an equal number. And the local has to do with those localities. In other states, it was maybe counties, but for the most part in Vermont, it was, there were some towns, and there were, I think, nine towns who uh, engaged in the lawsuit. And so, um, um, uh, not that each one of those towns are necessarily identified yeah. in the statute. I mean, you know, but it is the League of Cities and Towns, part of their job in, in the diversity of the cities and towns who either participated or whatever, they get to pick a bunch of people. Yeah. They get to pick 10. Right. And the other is an assistant judge. That's another local. So that's where the 11 comes in. Because in fact, you know this probably better than we do. Um, assistant judges are our county. Ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And so other, uh, you know, other than that, um, many of the um, members came from the uh, the draft that was um, um, worked on with the um, that was prevention 
um, coordinator and um, the uh, AG in okay. terms of things that were required. Right. So if, for example, with the equal, if we were to reduce the municipal by two, we'd have to reduce the state by two. Is that how that works? Okay. Thank you. Um, are there other questions over here? Yeah, I wish I could remember what it was. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so um, you're required to set a special fund. This, the national settlement says there has to be a special fund. There's no way around that. Um, I, I, I'm asking this, and this will be for future when, when there are conversations about other things. In, in this committee, we really don't like special funds. Um, and if there were a way not to have a special fund, we would try to do that. But we have no choice. So we have to have a special fund. Um, and so I, it, you've been very clear about the uses of it. Um, and again, that's very prescriptive. So it, it seems like we don't, there's not a lot of room for a conversation about that. So coming back to what our jurisdiction is, I think we are down to one, just making sure the special fund is created in a way that it makes sense to us. And then I think the other area is the, um, task force because that creates an appropriation even if it is out of a special fund we think about that as an appropriation the fact that it's a special fund doesn't mean we don't pay attention to how it how monies are spent there um so i think those are the two areas that the committee are we kind of focused down there so jim then P or harrison and We've been being informal because we haven't had witnesses, so I forget people's proper names. Oh, yeah, um, thank you. And going back to the uh, list of items you can spend out of this fund, um, I noticed one of them, for example, was uh, syringes and, and whatnot. We just, I thought we, we just did, I know in the BAA we did an extra appropriation for syringes uh, for Recovery Center. Could that have been applied to the fund? No. I, well, it's not? not so that for, this was an unusual one above whatever our standard would have been. No, that the, the, the organization that we provided that to oh. provide syringe exchange services in the state of Vermont and was absentmindedly uh, left off the list. Okay, there, so there are four actual organizations this one is actually headquartered in new hampshire but provides a lot of coverage but, but there was also vermont places we did too yes and it was an extra appropriation it was it was an extra the, the extra appropriation um i'm trying to remember here was just for that one organization because it was left off the list now there is a request for money in the in the budget but, there, but the BAA was that one organization. It, again, provides a lot of coverage in the, what, what do you call it, the Springfield, the Valley there. Yeah. Um, yeah. There. Okay, so and about the money in the budget. So here's the maintenance of effort issue. Yeah, so the people and, and, will need to watch that. Yeah, yep. yeah. okay. Okay, um, was there? Yes, I did. Yeah, Peter, Brett so, Jacob. Thank you. So, um, when do, I have two questions. When do you envision the first money going out as a result of the work of this group? I believe the health department who will be the lead agency is intending for the, for the committee to meet in this fiscal, coming up fiscal year, yep. and then uh, the funding request to initiate after that. So they, they can make recommendations and request the funding and get the funding. So it would, um, I believe will be uh, this year 23. 24. This year 23? 24. 24, so you're, you, they, you expect them to take an entire year to really determine what should be done prior to yeah, requesting yeah, funds that would go out the door in 24. So the, the bill um, anticipates that it goes through the budgeting process. So the advisory committee is gotcha. meeting 
they're building their recommendations into their their budget request goes through the appropriations process once the budget's approved then they're authorized to request the drawdown from the national fund gotcha and then the only other question i have is I just, I, this is maybe a question for um, I, I think there am i wrong to think that in fact the department is, is able to it could be part of the budget adjustment okay you know, so in terms of um this coming budget adjustment okay good then will we need to this is my final question will we need to authorize expenditures from the special fund in anticipation of receipt of funds because otherwise there's no money to pay these folks sounds like yes i'm not sure i understand the question okay, so we we will not be receiving any money until after the the uh, advisory group stands up figures out what they're going to do and makes a request to draw down money Oh. But all of the funds to pay the advisory group are embedded within the yeah. money that you intend to draw so down. So we're to going to need to a, we're going to need yes. an yeah. amendment to borrow in anticipation of the receipt of those funds. Yes. If you would kindly draft that, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McLean. Um, uh, I, I just watched the clock, and I just realized we lost a half an hour with it. There were over over time here. Um, but Rep Feltus? Well, I, this is how the uh, Volkswagen settlement works as yeah. well, in yeah. terms of we got so much money over 18 years. Right. Yeah. We have to ask for the money and then spend or Actually, we spend it. Yeah. yeah. Rep Shine? Thanks. Uh, just on the um, the 215%, so each of those is 9.6 million, if my math is correct. And uh, one is for like current opiate abatement, and one is for. Uh, could you just tell me again what those two categories are? Future. Prevention past. in the future, abatement right. for the past. And the 1515 well, is not part of this bill, yeah. so don't ask us about it. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. you're only talking about the 40. <laughs> so you're talking about the 44.8 million to set up setting up the fund. That's the money that will come in, not the uh, right, not 70% uh, of 64 million is 44.8. Million. Right, right. This is just so there are three buckets coming in through the settlement. Okay. A state bucket, a local bucket. Those are both fifteen percent each, and then there's the abatement bucket. That's seventy percent of the proceeds of the settlement, and those are what is um, coming through the special fund and what the advisory committee is authorized. Okay. To so the, those the, the other thirty percent won't have anything to do with the general assembly. Um, the state bucket. I I think the second book, book, second one, but that's, 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 that's not us. But not now. <laughs> okay. And so, so you have just under two and a half million every year coming in to spend on these things. Is the is the math? So two point eight nine million. Okay. I got two. Oh, two point eight. I got two point six. Just clarification. There's two settlements there. One of them is like ten years, maybe, and the or eleven years, and the other is eighteen years. I don't think the whole sixty four is out of eighteen years. If I remember my notes correctly and i'm not sure about the, the idea behind this is that there could be multiple settlements coming in and that the language is um general enough to be able to be a mechanism for all of those settlements to kind of flow through um my question is around the 22 member um committee and that is enormous um and interesting issues around just managing such a large group but why why could we could it be smaller could you half that what would, as chair pew mentioned that the bones of this did come from uh the attorney general's office and the state's chief prevention officer and uh, I believe the reason for the size is so uh, the perspectives of those who are doing this work is at the table uh, making recommendations. And the uh, advisory committee was prescribed in the national settlement. Having one was prescribed, but not the member or the composition. Right. So that is something that is in your jurisdiction or our jurisdiction as to the number and the makeup 
I understand that there needs to be some proportionality and representation. We discussed that earlier. Um, so while people have said yes to such a large committee, is there some reason why it cannot be smaller? And I'm just, the, the, the large committees are difficult to manage. Uh, they're expensive. I mean, you're going to be spending um, just under $15,000 a year just to gather people to have a conversation, um, cutting into the other funds available. <laughs> I'm just wondering why such a big committee. I think on some level it is exactly as um, Representative Garifano has outlined um, and one in terms of as the chief prevention officer and the um, assistant attorney um, general um, I've had conversations with myself and with the chair of Senate Health and Welfare. They identified um, and what uh, we have learned, for instance, is that it is important to have um, those impacted at the table and that having one person doesn't work. You need to have at least two um, because otherwise it becomes a bit, it doesn't work for them. So there, you have those kinds of things. So you have you know two people with um, lived experience. Um, you have um, and the importance of people on the ground as opposed to um, administrators only administrate people who are actually doing the work because this is um, yeah okay I mean, if, you know, if you tell us we have to do that we will look at it so this is an ongoing conversation yeah, right, we are right, having right. in this yeah. and we are actively saying um asking members of the House to really be thoughtful about how necessary is it to have half committees at all. We, we understand here that it is. I mean, then I, to be honest, and I will, I don't know if there was, I mean, I do think, I believe it is, and I'm looking to, um, um, to legislative council. I believe that there were nine cities who, who actually, were part of the, you know, suit themselves. And so there was some thought that whether or not it was those exact nine, but that that's, so you start there and then you need nine. And so right there, there's 18. Um, and then you don't. Um, that's, sort, that's sort of what I'm, and, uh, how much, I'll, I'll be on here, how much we could, say, take the Commissioner of Mental Health off. You know, because we because we already have the Chief Prevention Officer and the Health Department. And um, I believe, yeah. Um, and then, you know, that, that would get down to 20. I mean, but that's not because we would cut off one. But, I, you know. Um, okay, we may want to just have a, and all, yeah. a conversation about that. Um, representative, uh, the way we do our work in our committee, each of us is responsible, each of these guys is responsible for a budget area, and then the bill that is associated with that budget area um, is tied to the re that, that reporter. So Rep. Fagan has the Health Department substance use disorders, and so he'll be asking questions. Um, about this as we understand the bill and, and you know form our recommendation for how for for the bill and think about it before we vote. So um, 
looking at the committee to see if there are any other questions just about about the bill or again those two areas that are in our jurisdiction on uh, not seeing any um yeah Rep yeah Cavani? i'm sorry to prolong this i was just wondering though i'm reading um you know, it says the advisory committee shall adopt procedures to govern its procedures uh, govern its proceeding excuse me including voting procedure etc and in my mind i was imagining and i don't think we need to say this but if it would help them um the advisory committee may keyword may establish an executive committee i mentioned that because i remember back a long time ago when the tobacco control board was uh, formed commissioner kearney there was a large number of people similar to this many different concerns but there was a desire over time to be nimble sometimes even though the group is recommending i think to the legislature how to spend the money i think um there's a back and forth with the administration they may at some point say we want to use some of these dollars to match medicaid um the special funds it's not Medi it's not federal matching federal etc to do abc and the administ administration may say yay nay how about this and to, to convene 23 people back do those kinds of back and forth discussion yes it can be cumbersome and a real challenge so i wanted to ask ledge council do you think the advisory board has that kind of latitude should they want to anyways or does it have to be stated i think they have the latitude they can Thank adopt you. the procedure yeah okay that that could help with the uh, the perceived unwieldiness of such a large group but yeah it's in statute and mm -hmm. they have a chance for all stakeholders to discuss it sorry to be so long-winded no, no that's a good idea thank you that's very helpful that's what we try to do here it's something worth mulling um you've you've put it into the brains of rep fagan and rep garfana um so let, let's mull that over committee to, I mean, are you, are, are, while they're thinking about that, are there any other questions that you may have? If not, I think we should say thank you very much to the members from thank the you. Human Services Committee. Um, thank, you. thank you very much for your time. Um, I really appreciate your help in understanding the bill. We'll be in touch about how this is happening or how we're managing that. And with that,